great. So we're now going into our third episode and we've talked a little bit about dysbiosis. So we want to welcome Lizzie back again. And I wanted to talk a little bit about things that we're not really aware of in the medical profession, nor patients. Um, and that's about the impact of not having enough acid. We talk a lot about suppressing acid when people have indigestion or symptoms of reflux. But what we didn't realize is having low acid can also be troublesome. The other subject I wanted to talk about was food sensitivities. Um, this is different to food allergies, they're totally different sort of uh, process. And again, is it a cause or a consequence? Do we have bad guts and then get sensitivities? Or do sensitivities cause bad guts? So we're going to talk about these two subjects. So the first subject is um, this concept of having low acid, which causes problems. We, we're giving out of meprazole and famotidine to all our patients when they come in with acid-related problems. And even in children with reflux, a, a lot of the patients have been treated, but later on they seem to struggle. Do we cause problems by reducing acidity to a significant level? We do, definitely, um, and especially over time. Um, so initially the patient will feel so much better, as you said, they won't have that acidity, the heartburn sensation. Um, but with time, what we realise is that in suppressing the acidity of your stomach, which is there to break down our food, mm -hmm. we cause other issues. Yeah. Um, so over time, it is definitely an issue that we need to kind of keep in mind and address with these patients. Okay, so I guess the, the question is, all these patients on repeat prescriptions of omeprazole with suppression of their acidity long term, um, we need to be re-evaluating them maybe. Um, how would they present? How does low acidity present? Ultimately, it's also a form of indigestion. You might have similar symptoms like bloating, uh, nausea, you know, disturbed kind of stools, etc. Um, so similar maybe to someone who is presenting, you know, with um, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or, you know, other issues that we see in the gut. Um, so there's a bit of a mixed picture there, but you take a history, you establish that they've been on anti-acid medication or taking it over the counter for a long period of time. Often we also see that they're nutrient deficient, so their B12 levels might be low, their folate levels might be low, they might have ongoing issues with anemia. These are kind of end products yes. of, the, of the medication. Um, so we just take a step back and reevaluate. Reevaluate. Yeah. yeah. So I guess what happens is the food that's supposed to be brought down, broken down by these acids doesn't get broken down and we kick the can down the road a bit. So another part of the gut has to do something different to its day job and then we get the other symptoms coming back. Essentially, yeah. yeah. Okay, well that's, so generally speaking as physicians we should look at peptic disease um, and pharma use of medication for a period of time and then reevaluate yes. and see what we can do. That's, that sounds very sensible. Are there any natural ways of increasing the acidity? You need to establish why, yeah. why it's low. So obviously if they're on medication, there's potentially your answer, but then it's trying to figure out why they were on it. Sometimes it's a short-term solution. You know, if you have a hiatus hernia, by default, of course you need to be on it until that's fixed. Yeah. But sometimes there's other issues, histamine issues, mast cell issues, mm. uh, potentially a bacterial overgrowth in the intestine in the original or H. pylori. There's something deeper yes. causing um, okay. the low acidity yeah. and then we do need to address it. Yes, so testing and then looking at the cause. Exactly. And uh, excellent. And so if we've established low acidity, uh, we've got rid of any potential drugs, um, we've identified these dysbiotic bacteria, mm. then we just simply treat the bacteria and the whole thing goes away? Um, yeah, within reason. We obviously try and work on that. We rebalance it, but typically we support along the way until they're at a neutral place. So we can give um, betaine HCL. It's a form of hydrochloric acid that we need in the stomach. Yeah. We can give enzymes to help break down yeah. the food. So we support the patient until their body is able to yeah. make their own. We give them the support to step up, get rid of symptoms, then then let the body just yeah. carry on. Because it's a vicious cycle, as you said. Yeah. If it's not broken down, we don't have the right minerals. The right minerals mean we have less short-chain fatty acids. If you don't have those, your pH in your stomach goes up naturally. So mm -hmm. it all has to come together at the same time. Yeah. yeah, that's fascinating. Thank you. The second thing I want to talk about is food sensitivities. And very simply, is it a consequence of bad gut 
or a cause of bad gut? I would argue that it's a consequence um, because ultimately when we do food sensitivity testing, we're testing the peripheral blood. Um, and we, and ty typically people who have a lot of food sensitivities, it ultimately just means that their, leak, their gut is leaky. Um, and I, I do think it's a consequence more so. Yeah. Um, and it's definitely uh, reversible yeah. um, and something that we work on yes. by working on the gut lining yeah. and its content. Yeah, I mean, I concur. And it's a bit like the, we talked to in the earlier episode about the gut brain axis and the brain adrenal axis. What tends to happen is we step, set up a cycle of events, um, create inflammation, um, and then consequential things happen. Mm. And then that consequence then becomes a cause. So it's a yeah. It's just a vicious cycle. Um, but it is very reassuring that if we have people coming with food sensitivities, we take a decent history and we look at their gut very carefully, we could simply restore them back to their normal place. Whereas the general feeling out in the conventional world is just stay off that and you'll be okay. Mm. Um, of course, stay off it to reduce inflammation in the short term, but then you could, yeah. after rebuild, go back. So it's a very hopeful message again. Oh, definitely. Um, I mean, you know, as we see lots of patients who suffer with this, the gut is always evolving and changes occur overnight when you implement a change. Um, and so we see quick results for people who have long histories of imbalance Fantastic. and allergies and sensitivities and skin problems. Yeah. So. And tell me a little bit, just touching on, <clears throat> Um, we talked about excluding certain things in diet short term. Um, and what about these elemental diets, these FODMAP diets? Again, to me, it makes sense to give the gut some breathing space mm. by not putting too many histamine rich foods in and bland diets, even autophagy. Um, do you think there's a place for everyone to do an elemental or a FODMAP diet on a couple of month cycle? I don't think it's harmful. Um, I think there's a time and a place. Um, and I do, Elemental is very restrictive. Um, and I, I don't think that's something that someone should just go off and do on their own, in my opinion. FODMAP is a little bit different. Um, there's, there's a time and a place for that for sure. And obviously with testing, we kind of know when we need to implement it, but sometimes we can just do symptoms if testing is expensive. Yeah. Um, and there is a role for that for sure. Um, it gives the, the gut a breathing space. Um, and um, Autophagy and fasting, again, has a very similar effect um, and often greater downstream effects, positive ones as well. So, and something that's very easy for anyone to implement, it's very straightforward, you know, you're not eating. Yeah. Um, so I think there's definitely a role for all of them. Yeah. Some more restrictive than others and yeah. you do have to be careful. Yeah. So I guess the take home message is just give the gut some breathing space. Yeah. And it, I guess it doesn't matter which one as long as it's short term and supervised. Um, so yeah. that's a nice clear message for patients. Yeah. Excellent, thank you very much.